Anarchism and Human Nature Under what conditions do human beings thrive? When do human beings do well? In this video, I'd like to consider the needs and capacities that human beings have and argue that we thrive and realise our potential when our needs are met. Social hierarchy typically runs counter to the needs which human beings have and creates conditions under which people become alienated from the valuable capacities that they possess. If we want human beings to thrive and realise their potential, we ought to meet their essential needs. And since hierarchy runs counter to these needs, it ought to be dismantled whenever possible. Human nature, far from being an argument against anarchism, is a strong case for it, as a non-hierarchical society creates conditions under which human beings can unleash their true potential. A human nature argument for anarchism can begin with something called self-determination theory. Self-determination theory, initially founded by Edward Deasy and Richard Ryan, posits that human beings have three key psychological needs – competence, relatedness and autonomy. We need to feel that we are effective in dealing with the environment around us and that we are good at what we do. We need to feel a sense of connection with the other human beings around us and that we are cared for by others. We need to feel that we have some sense of control over our lives, that we aren't just pawns on a chessboard and that we are acting in accordance with our integrated sense of self and the values that we have developed over time. According to self-determination theory, or SDT, these essential needs are not learned, but are inherent to human nature and exist across all societies and cultures. To the extent that these needs are met, well-being is enhanced, and to the extent that they are thwarted, we can expect people to become ill and alienated. The model of human nature that SDT supports is, in my opinion, a stable base that lends itself well to anarchism. SDT shows that we call for anarchist forms of organisation because the core needs and drives we possess as human beings require it, and because social hierarchy runs counter to these needs and drives. A 2003 study published in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology found support for the notion that we have a need for autonomy and that this need is cross-cultural. Quote, We found that whatever cultural practices one is considering, there appears to be a positive relation between more internalised or autonomous regulation of those practices and well-being. We found that whether one's behaviour and attitudes are individualistic, collectivistic, horizontal or vertical in nature, more autonomous enactment is associated with greater well-being. We see the very nature of vertical social arrangements as more inherently conflictual vis-à-vis -vis SDT's postulated basic needs for autonomy and relatedness. Vertical societies frequently require individuals to forego autonomy and to subordinate themselves to heteronymous influences. In addition, vertical societies place boundaries around those with whom intimacy and connectedness can be established. This study shows that, across diverse cultures, the issue of autonomy can be similarly understood, and that, across diverse practices, autonomy is associated with well-being. Another study by Ed DC and Richard Ryan looked at the well-being of workers in state-owned companies in Bulgaria and compared this with workers in a United States corporation. They found that the degree of autonomy supportiveness of the work climate did predict overall need satisfaction in each culture, and need satisfaction in turn predicted both task engagement and well-being. Thus, by showing that satisfying these needs promotes motivation and mental health across cultures, results of the study are consistent with the view that these needs are universal. Autonomy is also an important need not just for adult workers but for young people in school. A study looking at adolescent satisfaction with life in school again found a relationship between support for autonomy and well-being across different cultures, particularly Denmark and the United States. To the extent that adolescents felt that their parents and teachers understand their perspectives and allowed them to make their own choices, adolescents positively perceived their lives and their experiences in school. In contrast, when adolescents felt controlled by their parents and teachers and felt that these authorities treated the adolescents' own experiences and choices as relatively unimportant, they reported lower satisfaction with life and school. 
A 2001 study by Cherkov and Ryan looking at students' self-motivation and well-being found that for both Russian and US adolescents, the issue of autonomy support versus control by parents and teachers has salience and significance. It appears that in both cultural samples, perceiving others as supporting one's autonomy facilitates well-being and self-motivation. The need to experience one's behaviour as self-regulated and self-endorsed may be critical to psychological health across human groups, as self-determination theory has suggested. Human beings have an innate need to have control over their lives, and also to feel as if the people around them facilitate this sense of control. As anarchists, we believe that, for example, workplaces ought to be owned and run democratically by their workers because this kind of economic arrangement, called workers' self-management, meets the human needs of the workers for autonomy. It seems very unusual to suggest that meeting the innate human need for autonomy is somehow contrary to human nature, when we have reason to believe that people having autonomy is associated with positive psychological outcomes. Ed DC contrasts autonomous motivation and controlled motivation as follows. Autonomous motivation really means to do something with a full sense of willingness, volition, endorsement of the activity. It's having a sense of this is what I want to be doing now. This is what I choose to be doing now. The experience that goes along with what we call controlled motivation, which is what I'm talking about now, is that I'm feeling pressured and tense about it. There's, the forces are operating on me and making me be doing this, for instance. One study looked at the relationship between autonomous motivation, controlled motivation, and the outcome of interpersonal therapy for recurrent depression. It found that for those with highly recurrent depression, the therapeutic alliance predicted remission, while autonomous motivation had no effect. However, for those with less recurrent depression, the therapeutic alliance and autonomous motivation resulted in greater likelihood of achieving remission. Importantly, controlled motivation was negatively associated with achieving remission across the board. Autonomous motivation is also a predictor of something called flow. Flow describes a state in which a person becomes fully immersed and focused on an activity. They are completely engaged, they have a full and thorough appreciation for what they are doing, and this brings them intense feelings of enjoyment. A Hungarian psychologist, whose name I haven't a hope of pronouncing, identified a number of characteristics of flow states, which includes, but is not limited to, having a feeling of control over the task, feeling that one's skills are meeting a challenge, and the experience itself being intrinsically rewarding. A study looking at flow in the context of higher education found that psychology students experienced more flow when they were autonomously motivated as opposed to having controlled motivation. Giving people autonomy meets the essential needs of humans, and this need satisfaction enhances people's capacity to fully engage themselves with what's going on. Conversely, when people are deprived of their autonomy, when we go through the experience of feeling like, as Ed DC says, forces are operating on us and making us behave in a certain way, our needs are unsatisfied, and that diminishes our capacity to engage with what's going on. For examples of this, we can look at how rewards, a simple example of imposing controlled motivation on people, do this and you'll get that, affect us. We have reason to believe that dangling goodies in front of people in order to get them to behave in a certain way is inherently destructive to human nature. Rewards increase the likelihood that we will do something, but they change the way we do it. Alfie Cohn writes, they offer one particular reason for doing it, sometimes displacing other motivations, and they change the attitude we take towards the activity. When people are rewarded for doing something, they continue doing it for as long as the reward persists, but when the rewards run out, they lose their interest in it. For example, in 1972, a systematic review of the research looking at token economies, which dispense rewards for acting in a certain way, found that there were numerous reports of token programs showing behaviour change only while contingent token reinforcement is being delivered. Generally, removal of token reinforcement results in decrements in desirable responses and a return to baseline or near baseline levels of performance. In other words, when the goodies stopped, people lost an interest. 
A study looking at children's interest in particular games when rewards were involved found that when the rewards started, the kids promptly gravitated to the games that led to a payoff. When the rewards disappeared, their interest in those games dropped significantly, to the point that many were now less interested in them than were children who had never been rewarded in the first place. A review of 28 programs encouraging people to wear seatbelts found that reward-based programs which gave people prizes or cash for wearing seatbelts were the least effective over the long haul, whereas programs without rewards were actually more effective, which was contrary to the predictions of the authors. Rewards tend to produce temporary compliance, not behaviour change that lasts beyond the reward. When in a situation where someone is saying, do this and you'll get that, our minds tend to assume that the reward is the only reason for doing the activity, hence why we lose interest as soon as the goodies stop. But when we are in these conditions, we also tend to feel as if our behaviour is being controlled by external forces. By getting us to think this way, rewards actively undermine our intrinsic interest in the activity at hand and our autonomous motivation. If an activity is creative, stimulating and interesting, this will be undermined when rewards are introduced. Teresa Amabile has conducted multiple studies looking at rewards and creativity and found that young creative writers wrote less creative poetry when made to focus on rewards. Children and adults making collages and inventing stories also had their creativity undermined from the use of rewards and professional artists did less creative work when being rewarded. A study by Sam Glucksberg found that offering people rewards for a task involving the use of creative thinking to solve problems actually resulted in them taking longer than those not being rewarded. The effect of offering someone a reward for doing something is to diminish that person's creativity. When people are made to do things in order to get rewards, the rewards interfere with their performance. A 1971 study with high school students found that people being promised rewards did a poorer job on a variety of tasks than people who weren't. A 1981 study by Fabes and colleagues found that undergraduate students had a lower level of intellectual functioning when they were rewarded for their scores on the more sophisticated parts of an intelligence test. In fact, in Drive, the surprising truth about what motivates us, Dan Pink argues that rewards ought to be used when the task itself is menial or requires very little thought or creativity. Morton Deutsch argues that rewards work best for those who are alienated from their work, that is, for people doing tasks that seem pointless or a drudge where there isn't any intrinsic interest to be found in the activity itself. Alfie Cohn writes, Rewards usually improve performance only at extremely simple, indeed mindless, tasks, and even then they improve only quantitative performance. At this point, we ought to take a moment to consider the need human beings have for competence and note that being trained for compliance not only undermines people's autonomy, but also reduces their creative and intellectual faculties. Another study found that the use of controlling teaching methods makes children more prone to helpless behaviour and this interferes with their performance. We can look further at how hierarchy affects people by considering the impact of competition on human relationships. Hierarchical systems, by their very nature, create centres of power, and these centres of power may or may not be treated as scarce resources that people have to compete with each other to obtain. Indeed, capitalist society valorises the notion that individuals ought to compete with each other for the acquisition of wealth and resources. Alfie Cohn writes, In the workplace, one tries to remain at friendly terms with one's colleagues, but there is guardedness, a part of the self-held in reserve. Even when no rivalry exists at the moment, one never knows whom one will have to compete against next week. Carol Ames found that, in her studies with children, competition can cause people to believe that they are not the source of, or in control of, what happens to them, and this external locus of control interferes with their performance. This is contrasted with an internal locus of control, where people feel that the outcomes of what happens in their lives are determined by their own actions, as opposed to external forces beyond their control. A study by David and Roger Johnson found that cooperative learning, when compared with competitive and individualistic learning situations, promoted more positive attitudes towards heterogeneity among peers, higher self-esteem, more positive attitudes toward the teacher, fellow cooperators and conflict, more internal locus of control and higher daily achievement. The mutually exclusive goal attainment that characterises competition, 
I succeed only if you fail, compels people to work at cross purposes. It erodes our sense of community by creating anxiety and hostility in our relations with other people. A famous experiment called the Robbers Cave Experiment looked at the behaviour of Boy Scouts in situations of cooperation and competition. As the experiment predicted, when the Boy Scouts were separated into groups and set against each other to compete, they developed hostile attitudes to one another. Alfie Cohn writes, The boys began taunting and insulting each other, in some cases turning against good friends who were now on the opposing team. They burned each other's banners, planned raids, threw food and attacked each other after the games and at night. When the groups were cooperating toward common goals, people were a lot nicer to each other. David and Roger Johnson carried out 37 studies looking at different learning arrangements, cooperative and competitive, and in 35 of these studies it was found that cooperation enhances interpersonal attraction among students. Interpersonal attraction refers to a number of effects, such as more giving and receiving of encouragement to and from peers, greater sensitivity to the needs of others, less self-centeredness, greater capacity to imagine the perspective of others, fewer difficulties communicating communicating and greater trust. While competition creates anxiety, aggression and hostility, cooperative conditions promote far more empathic behaviour. Remember the human need for relatedness and consider that cooperative conditions are far more suited to meeting this need than competitive ones. As anarchists, we promote cooperation over competition precisely because we see cooperation as being fundamentally more in line with our human need to feel connected to others. What self-determination theory shows is that human beings have innate needs and capacities for competence, relatedness and autonomy, and that to the extent that these needs are met, human beings will thrive, and to the extent that they are thwarted, human beings will become ill and alienated. The conditions of social hierarchy, in which people are subjected to control from above, and in which people are encouraged to compete with one another for power and resources, creates an environment in which the needs for competence, relatedness and autonomy are not met, resulting in ill-being and alienation. Subordination to authority undermines autonomous motivation, reduces our intellectual and creative faculties, and ruptures our relationships with our peers. If we suppose that the needs for competence, relatedness and autonomy should be met, and if we see hierarchical organisation as conflictual to these needs, then the anarchist position, which is that hierarchy has a burden of proof to meet, and that if it fails to meet this burden of proof, it should be dismantled and replaced with horizontal organisation, is entirely consistent with the view of human nature posited by self-determination theory. We are anarchists because living as self-determined, curious and thoughtful agents, cultivating our skills and abilities and sharing in the experience of this cultivation as part of a community is fundamentally more in line with our inherent needs and capacities as human beings than being made to live as fragmented, alienated, atomized machines responding to external forces. With this in mind, to show that anarchism is incompatible with human nature, the advocate for social hierarchy has a number of options. One option is to argue that hierarchy meets other more essential needs that human beings have and does so more effectively than non-hierarchy. A second option is to accept SDT, but to argue that social hierarchy is somehow not conflictual to the needs. A third option is to argue that the premises of SDT are false, and I think you would be hard pressed to find evidence for any of these. Many thanks to my contributors on Patreon, Brandon Halkus Tischer, Deviath Fir, Flagburner, Google Hushabye Valley or I'll Give You a Swirly, Joe Martin, Marty, Michael Norling, Neganote, Patrick Gordon, Richard Pearson, Solidarity Dog, and Triple X Swagmaster 420 Triple X. This has been Libertarian Socialist Rants. Thanks for watching.